Welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for a very special edition of Wright Virtual Visits. Today we will have representatives from all eight of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites as part of our event. Um, and instead of doing the regular format of a live walkthrough um, of each site, we have compiled a very interesting video highlighting the outstanding universal value of each uh, site. So we will start today in just a moment with a video. And then during that time, if you have any questions or comments, please put those in the comments section on Facebook and we will address them as many as possible. But first, before we start, the video. I would like to say thank you to uh, Nikki and Katie with Forever Ready Productions for sponsoring the live streaming of Wright Virtual Visits events. And also, I would like to say a quick thank you to a volunteer of Unity Temple Restoration Foundation, Lou Kai Chi, who has produced the video we are about ready to watch. Now, uh, when UNESCO considers the credibility for World Heritage designation, it evaluates the outstanding universal value of the applicants. So what is outstanding universal value or OUV? Uh, it means the cultural and or natural significance, which is so exceptional as to transcend national boundaries and to be of common importance for present and future generations of all humanities. Now for our site, the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright, the OUV um, entails uh, eight properties, of course, that have figured prominently in shaping the course of architecture, playing a definitive role in the development and evolution of modern architecture in the first half of the 20th century. So now we're going to go ahead and roll the video. So sit back, enjoy about 16 and a half minutes. And again, during uh, the video at any time, if you have any comments or questions, please feel free to enter them. And uh, we'll come back with all representatives from all eight sites when the video is finished for some Q&A. Three attributes exemplify the important inclusion of the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright as a World Heritage Site. The attribute that most clearly defines Unity Temple is the creation of an architecture responsive to functional and emotional needs through geometric abstraction and spatial manipulation. Dynamic forms employ innovative structural methods and inventive use of new materials and technologies. The aesthetic intent and structure is united through the early use of a single material, reinforced concrete. The spatial continuity is expressed through the open plan and blurred transitions between interior and exterior spaces, as observed through the entry from the terrace to the lobby, as well as the abstracted forms of nature viewed on the exterior column capitals through geometric clear story windows, essentially integrating nature from the outside in. The richness of experience is created through carefully composed paths of movement, revealing contrast between light and dark, solid and void, compression and release. The nature of Unity Temple's groundbreaking use of reinforced concrete is an early example of béton bruit, a French term that is used to describe raw concrete that is left unfinished after being cast. The exterior geometric shapes and cubic forms are reinforced on the interior by patterns with thin oak strips that weave together cubic volumes, piers, balconies, and ceiling through continuous and dynamic patterns while amber art glass skylights wash the interior, unifying the whole. Unity Temple was designed for a Unitarian congregation, emphasizing Wright's understanding of the importance of human nature in discovering religious truths. It was a radical break from long-standing Western notions and conventions of religious architecture. Unity Temple is an icon of the modern architectural movement and is widely considered to be Wright's most important contribution to modern architecture. Built between 1908 and 1910, it is here at the Roby House where Frank Lloyd Wright made the open plan concept an integral part of his organic architecture. In this later prairie style home, Wright eliminated the walls between the living and dining rooms. They are divided only by a central chimney to create a single expansive space for domestic family life. The casement art glass windows and French doors whose patterns of diagonal geometries in the art glass evoke the natural fauna 
and allow entry to sweeping porches on the south, east, and west sides of the room, extending the interior into the garden. Slatted vertical screens surround the staircase and an original dining set with high back chairs allowed Wright to create an intimate private space for the Roby family and friends within the otherwise open room. Wright wanted to reduce the rooms in a house to the barest essentials, to have these spaces be free flowing and to unify the indoors with the outdoors. Hi, welcome to Taliesin. My name is Ryan Houston. I'm the director of preservation. We're excited to we're excited to celebrate these eight UNESCO World Heritage sites. I'm here at the Hill Crown at Taliesin to talk about how Wright married this building into its natural surroundings. Wright was familiar with this Hill Crown since he was a boy, and he decided to make Taliesin of the hill, not on it. And as you can see as well from here, that the roof lines are sympathetic to the rolling hills beyond. Um, also, Wright uses a material palette that's sympathetic to the area by using uh, cedar shingles that naturally gray, as well as limestone that was quarried less than a quarter of a mile away from the site. This helps the building feel like it rises out of the, out of the site, not merely placed on top of it. Uh, Wright even was led to, even said that during the winter when the snow sweeps up on the eaves, it looks like the, uh, the house looks like the hill itself. And um, due to Wright's thoughtful consideration of materials and location of the building, the house and hill look as if they've always been together. Hollyhock House is a modern interpretation of indigenous forms from the region while retaining key features of his earlier work, such as strong horizontal lines and innovative spatial arrangements, the architect embraced the freedom and natural beauty of California. For every interior space at Hollyhock House, there's a corresponding outdoor one. Rooms open out onto picturesque courtyards, rooftop terraces are important living spaces. And these features become synonymous with California modernism, taken up by right protégés like Rudolf Schindler, who first came to Los Angeles to work on Hollyhock House. In designing for the region, Wright looked to pre-Hispanic structures. He evoked rather than imitated Maya architecture with his designs here. The canted upper walls with pronounced eaves resemble those of the Palace of Palenque in Southern Mexico. The decorative stonework also relates to the dense patterning of Maya facades that the architect admired. Wright also borrowed from other regional precedents. While he characterized Southern California's colonial revival architecture as tawdry Spanish medievalism, he couldn't resist incorporating a Spanish-style courtyard at the center of Hollyhock House. The integration of livable roof terraces draws on native Pueblo building traditions as well. While Wright may have taken general forms from cultures before, he made the designs for Hollyhock House distinctly his own. Motifs here certainly don't replicate anything seen in the Yucatan. Hi, I'm Justin Gunther, the director of Falling Water, and we're excited to celebrate the anniversary of the inscription to the UNESCO World Heritage List of the 20th century architecture of Frank Lloyd Wright. Falling Water was designed by Wright in 1935 for the Kaufman family of Pittsburgh, and is regarded as one of Wright's seminal examples of his philosophy of organic architecture, where Wright was trying to create a seamless interaction between human habitation and the natural world. And here at Falling Water, Wright's able to achieve a unified design because he bases the entire inspiration in nature's forms and principles. So the limited palette of colors, materials, and design motifs that he uses throughout the architecture, both inside and out, is all taken from the native woodland landscape here, all inspired by what we see and the setting around us. 
And by doing so, by uniting inside and outside space with these reiterated concepts, he creates a unified composition that is uniquely tied to its setting. And I think that's most easily seen and best illustrated just by looking at the overall form of the house, the building itself. So like the rushing water and the waterfalls, the house is a cascade. The way it steps down the hillside site, the way it ends in soaring cantilevers over the rock ledges of the waterfall. Wright takes primary inspiration from the main feature of the natural landscape, translates it into dramatic sculptural three-dimensional space, and thus ties the building to its site. And I think too, if you look at the overall form, Wright's paying reverence to the old growth forest, to the trees in the landscape. The central stone tower is like a giant vertical tree trunk. And then reaching out from it are the smooth floating cantilevers and slabs of reinforced concrete. And then to further tie the whole composition to the site, all of the rock of the walls was quarried directly from the site laid up in uneven rough patterns to mimic the natural rock strata found in the landscape, giving this, this appearance that the house is growing up out of native rock. So all of these ideas give Falling Water its outstanding universal value. and make Falling Water Wright's tour de force. It's his response, his reaction to the machine age aesthetic of the international style. But here at Falling Water, he does it in a much more humanistic, site-specific, natural, organic way. And even though he's embracing the fundamentals of modern design, he's pushing them in totally new directions in truly beautiful, unique ways that continue to inspire us to this day. Welcome to the Herbert and Catherine Jacobs house, Frank Lloyd Wright's first built Usonian style house. The house was designed in 1936, built in 1937, and revolutionized American domestic architecture in the mid 20th century. Wright eliminated all walls between the living room, dining room, and kitchen, essentially borrowing space from each room to make the total live much larger than the small 1,400 square foot footprint. He also increased the livability of these spaces by raising the roof and making the ceilings much higher to increase the feeling of spaciousness. This is most evident in the small kitchen with its highest ceiling of the house. Wright turned the houses back to the street to increase the privacy, but also opened the back of the house up to encourage outside living in the large double lot. Thank you for visiting the Herbert and Catherine Jacobs house. Hello and welcome to Taliesin West. I'm Fred Prezillo, Vice President of Preservation for the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation. And today we are celebrating the anniversary of our inscription uh, as a World Heritage Site, UNESCO World Heritage Site. One of the amazing things about Taliesin West is uh, the procession through which you move through the site. Wright created these interconnected pathways uh, that move you through, uh, so you really experience the buildings in a wonderful way, setting up pathways that look off into the distance off the property, connecting you to the mountains surrounding the site, to the valley. Uh, so it really makes for an impressive movement through Taliesin West, uh, really connecting you not only to the buildings here, but to the greater landscape, celebrating Taliesin West as an amazing building here in this desert Southwest. So as you enter Taliesin West, you pass Frank Lloyd Wright's office, where you might often first stop and greet and meet with Frank Lloyd Wright. 
And then you enter into the property. First arriving into this little court, which uh, really then starts uh, to present different options to move through Taliesin West. You can move out onto the prow, which was kind of a communal space for the fellowship here at Taliesin West. Uh, looking out over the valley, this commanding view, which Wright termed, you know, like standing on the edge of the world, looking out over the universe. Uh, he loved that amazing view. Uh, and then, you know, you move through the site, move around the prow to his private quarters, or you could come up this way and head down what we call the pergola. It's the main circulation spine through Taliesin West. Uh, moving down that pathway, you could enter into the studio, into the kitchen and the dining room, and then private spaces. Um, and then here, he can lead you up a couple of flights of steps to the garden squares where they would gather. And he creates this amazing vignette, this amazing position where you know he takes you into this lower court he raises you up a few steps with the fountain uh, creating a beautiful space to gather around the fountain takes you up a few more steps to the garden squares uh, layering the scene with the garden squares the citrus grove behind the garden squares the mountain and the sky you know setting everything up like a Japanese print the prints that he loves so much these are just a couple of examples of how Wright leads you through Taliesin West and why we think it's such an amazing space and why uh, the world, uh, UNESCO, believe we are worthy of inscription as a World Heritage Site. Thanks for sharing a moment with us. We hope to see you sometime soon out here at Taliesin West. Opened to the public on October 21st, 1959, the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum became one of the most important and iconic buildings of Frank Lloyd Wright's late career. The unique architecture of the space, with its spiral ramp riding to a domed skylight, is a temple of spirit, a monument where art and architecture feed off of one another in captivating ways. The Guggenheim also represents Wright's understanding of what a great public building should do standing out from its environment and challenging the idea of the vertical surface. With its organic form and curving shape, the Guggenheim stands as a sculptural object that goes against the conventionality of New York's rectilinear format. Wright has created an innovative work that redefines how we normally think of architecture and also provides a unique forum for the public to enjoy contemporary art. Today, the museum continues to be an internationally renowned destination that caters to the public's ever-evolving interest in art and architecture. everybody and we're going to bring up representatives from all of the sites right now and while we're doing that we'd just like to apologize for the lag in the video we're not exactly sure uh, what was going on there but we will be uploading a clean copy of the video to our Facebook page um, after this uh, live stream so thank you for sticking with us and being patient through that and let's see getting the rest of the people up here Okay, we do have a number of questions, but before we get to those, I'm gonna ask that everybody um, just quickly introduce themselves, give your name, your title, the site you represent, and also um, your outstanding universal value that's specific to your site. We're gonna do this in chronological order of the inscription. So I guess I'll start as Unity Temple is the um, oldest building of, of the eight. I'm Heidi Ruley, Executive Director of the Unity Temple Restoration Foundation. And our outstanding universal value is the use of dynamic forms that employ innovative use of materials. So next would be Roby. Hi everyone, I am Sarah Holian and I am the curator at the Frank Lloyd Wright Trust and here I am at Roby House. Uh, our outstanding value is spatial continuity expressed through the open floor plan. Hi everybody, uh, my name is Ryan Houston. I'm the director of preservation at Taliesin 
in our outstanding universal value is an architectural form that has an integral relationship with its natural setting. Hi, I'm Abby Chamberlain Brock. I'm the curator at Holly Hawk House. And Holly Hawk House represents the transformation of inspirations from other places and cultures. And it's an original adaptation of the Spanish uh, patio house combined with ancient Mesoamerican forms. Everyone, Justin I'm Justin Hicks. Gunther. Yep, I'm Justin Gunther, the director at Falling Water. Falling Water's OUV is based in the idea of uh, unity and design expressed in the integration of parts to the whole. Hello, everyone. I'm Bill Martinelli, caretaker of the Herbert and Catherine Jacobs House in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, the first Jacobs House is the primary illustration in the series of how this architecture addressed changing modes of domestic living in the 20th century. Hello, I'm Fred Prezillo, Vice President of Preservation at uh, Talias West, and uh, our outstanding universal value is uh, primary illustration in the series of contrast and carefully composed paths of movement, creating richness of experience. Hi, I'm, I'm Tracy Bashkoff. I'm the Senior Director of Collections and Senior Curator at the Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum. And our outstanding universal value is how this architecture addressed changing modes of public living in the 20th century. Well, thank you again, all of you for joining us today. And as I mentioned, we do have some questions that popped up. So I'm gonna get started with those. Uh, and some of these are specific to a site. Some of them are just more uh, UNESCO inscription in general. So if anybody wants to jump in for those, feel free. Um, the first one is, is there a plan to add additional sites to the World Heritage Group over time? And if no one jumps in, I guess I can answer, but if someone else wants to go, please do. Wow. Okay. So no, as far as I'm aware, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, no, there's no plan to um, add additional sites. Originally, there was a plan for 10 sites, and um, the World Heritage Committee asked for um, the group to narrow that down a bit and be a little more specific in um, the attributes for the um, inscription. So that was settled on the eight that are part of um, the early the first half of the 20th century of, of Frank Lloyd Wright's modern architecture. Um, they, uh, it's quite the process. And uh, Justin, I don't mean to put you on the spot, but I know your predecessor was heavily involved in the process, which took what, about 17 years? Yeah, an almost two decade process for inscription. So yeah, you go through getting on the United States tentative list first with the National Park Service and then you work through the different levels of, of political bureaucracy within your, your country uh, before you reach the stage of uh, presenting to UNESCO for actual inscription. And I would just add to, to Heidi's comments um, that while there's only eight sites represented as part of this serial inscription, um, as illustrative of Wright's body of work, uh, it's really an inscription to honor all of Wright's legacy, which includes over 400 extant buildings um, across this country, Canada and Japan, uh, as well as thousands of, of designs. So while there's only eight physical sites, it's representative of his entire body of work. Thanks, Justin. Um, so let's see. What's my next one here? Okay, so um, this one is for Let's go to Holly Hawk. Do you know if, um, and forgive me if I pronounce your name wrong, Aileen Barnstall used the outdoor living spaces right designed for her, like the patio and roof terraces? Yeah, we are really fortunate to have copies of the photos that Aileen Barnstall uh, captured during her short time living here at the house. And we see patio furniture, wicker and wrought iron, certainly not Frank Lloyd Wright design furniture um, out on the center patio, a patio table out out on the east facade. So while um, both Barnstall and, and Wright um, really embrace the potential for indoor outdoor living that this house afforded, um, maybe not necessarily with the, the right design as, as he intended. And and the architecture itself, you know, also lends itself to some theatrical moments. And while some scholars have supposed that 
this house was designed to host performances, we know that um, very likely that those didn't actually happen until an art club moved into the house shortly after the house was gifted to the city in 1927. So it did take on particular um, use of some of these rooftop, rooftop terraces as performance spaces. Okay, and uh, thank you, Abby. And back to you, Justin, because there's a question about how did falling water jumpstart Frank Lloyd Wright's career again? So if you can kind of take your mind to when this house was designed in the 1930s, it's the Great Depression. Um, so just across the country, not a lot of building was happening uh, in the architecture world. So Wright uh, was in the same situation of not having a lot of commissions being realized. Um, and he also, at this point in his career, while he was viewed as one of the seminal figures that kind of ushered in ideas of modernism, uh, many of the great moderns in Europe that were pushing the movement forward viewed him as kind of a grandfather of the movement at this time. Um, so in a way, he was, uh, while ushering in the movement was kind of seen as an, an older figure and not pushing pushing the movement forward as much as the Europeans were. Um, so luckily he uh, found a set of clients in the Kaufman family uh, that were, were willing to explore a pretty revolutionary design to put him back on the international scene. Um, so while embracing kind of the tenets of modernism and falling waters architecture, he pushes the whole movement forward uh, with new ways of thinking in an organic way. Um, and because of the remarkable character of the house, uh, you know, right, right as it was finished, it landed on the cover of Time magazine. So he was kind of instantly famous uh, again on the worldwide scene and it jettisoned his career into its most prolific phase um, from that point forward. Thanks, Justin. Um, I've got one here for Roby House. For Sarah, what happened to the original furniture in Roby House? Well, that's a great question. We know that the first few families who lived here um, took very little with them. The first family just took a bed, the Robies. The following family um, took one of the lamps with them and some linens. Uh, and we're fortunate that most of the furniture um, remained with the house when it was sold until the house was acquired by the University of Chicago. And so the majority of the furniture um, is still owned by the University of Chicago and is on display in the Smart Museum. I bet you can still see some of it um, on display or in the Smart Museum. So thank you for that. Um, I have a question for Tracy at Guggenheim. How does art and architecture interact in the space and then impact the viewer? Um, thank you. Um, you know, uh, my um, as a curator, my use of the space is um, not as an architectural architectural historian, and so you know, I love to be among this um, company here. But as a more experiential um, use, and um, I've been hanging exhibitions at the Guggenheim for for uh, thirty years now, and um, it's always just a, a an amazing experience. And I think looking at art at the Guggenheim is um, unlike any other museum experience. You um, find yourself walking the spiral and, um, and encountering art as you move. Um, it allows the curator to tell a story in a very linear way with the art, but also in a way that you're always conscious of being able to see where you came from and where you're going as you move through the building. And um, that experience, I think, for the viewer um, ends up in a very uh, memorable um, moment. And I think that, uh, you know, one always remembers what they've seen on view at the given time. All right, thank you, Tracy. Um, I have an interesting one for Taliesin West. So Fred, what are the four posts sticking out of the facade at an angle? Four posts sticking out of um, I can only uh, imagine that they're referring to uh, the beams that uh, connect, uh, well, they, they run across the top of the building and then wrap down and around uh, and connect into the side. So Wright was creating built up beams that he could take 
frames of two by fours, wrap them with canvas, and then step these canvas panels in between these large built up beams uh, to create a giant pavilion, a giant tent uh, that they uh, basically lived in over the winter months. Uh, it, Bright was at Talias and West escaping the Wisconsin winters. Um, he was down here enjoying the beautiful weather. And so really, he, he never really referred to Talias and West as his winter home. It was always his winter camp. And uh, he was just camping out. And so these structures that he created, uh, desert masonry at the base, which was a material that really represented the desert floor. So it made it feel like the building grew out of the desert floor. And then he put these little ephemeral tops, these were big built up beams that the, 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 the roof uh, tied into the walls and then just strung canvas between. And it really worked out here in the beautiful weather under the sun and uh, enjoyed the winters. And uh, when the weather started heating up, he went back to his home in Wisconsin, Taliesin. That's, uh, it's really interesting that you referred to it as his camp and not his home. Um, so thanks for that. And, and to stay on the material kind of line of questioning, um, there's one for Unity Temple. Was concrete the original material choice for Unity Temple? And actually, no. One of uh, Frank Lloyd Wright's first, um, or one of his initial sketches for the building shows it in brick. And if you are familiar with the Larkin Building in New York, um, this was, Unity Temple was designed shortly after that one. And there was a lot more similarity there with that material choice. But due to budget, um, the, the congregation had a very limited budget to work with, the choice of concrete was made to fit within budget. And I'm, I'm glad it was because that's one of the main attributes that Unity Temple holds for its uh, inscription. Um, and then another material question, but this time it's for Taliesin. Uh, what materials did Wright use to make Taliesin? Okay, happy to answer that. Yeah. So Ryan, yep. Yep, sometimes we get confused. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, so up here at, at Taliesin, uh, the material palette that he used, um, starting with the roofs, are, are cedar shingles, um, and those are those gray, those naturally gray over time. So one thing that I found over my time here that I really appreciate about this building and really appreciate about Wright's style is I think he thinks a little bit more about building aging and aging gracefully, and so that allows that to, to happen. Uh, then uh, all the wood predominantly outside and inside actually is uh, cypress, which which is a bit bizarre in Wright's over here because um, it's not, it, cypress is not native to uh, Wisconsin. In fact, that's more found uh, down in Louisiana and uh, down in the uh, southern part of, of the uh, Americas. And, and honestly, we, we don't know why that uh, particular selection was made. There's some different theories posited, but um, as uh, Mr. Wright is, is often happy to do for us, he leaves us a mystery there. And uh, then the next big material is the stone that we see, and that stone is limestone that was quarried on the river bluffs. Um, and in fact, we uh, on the property is still one of the is one of the quarries actually where the stone isn't is what you can see. And then finally, um, the plaster is uh, initially when it was when Talias and one was built, it was done uh, using the materials from the site, so the sand from the river, the water from the river. And then also um, the the plaster, the lime was made by slacking um, the limestone, which is essentially a process of burning limestone at a very high heat, adding water that turns into lime. A little more complicated than that, uh, but that's essentially what happens. Then you mix that in a ratio with water and sand from the river, along with any um, uh, integral coloring you want. That could be crushed bone shells, um, things like that. Um, crushed minerals, things like that, if you impart color into the plaster. Uh, as Taliesin uh, moved on, um, Wright used a lot of other materials to make that plaster. Uh, cement comes into four. Uh, I, I think something for us all to remember, and I think it, it harkens to all the buildings, is during Wright's career, um, there are several innovations in construction, one of them being sheen nails. Um, before that, you had to have a, somebody make that. Uh, another one being plywood, which of course spans in all directions and is uh, was used a lot for furniture, but also in the buildings. 
Um, and then also the ability to make large panes of glass uh, um, also came in, and you see that in many buildings as well. And then the, the final thing, and uh, what ended up getting used sometimes at Taliesin is Portland cement also becomes much more popular too, and we experimented with that. So uh, the, the, those are the primary materials for Taliesin, but then uh, as it was sort of a, a, a way for him to try uh, new things and uh, experiment with new materials, he, uh, those other, we do see some Portland and some other things used. So that's what comprises a, a material palette at Taliesin. Well, Wright sure didn't make it uh, simple, did he? Lots of different materials for all of these buildings. Um, I have um, two more questions and then we're gonna be wrapping up. One is for Bill at Jacob's One House. Where did that go? How has the um, uh, inscription um, affected visitation at the house? Well, actually it hasn't affected it much because shortly after the UNESCO inscription um, you know, pandemic hit, us all and uh so tours pretty much ended uh it's starting to pick back up a little bit now um no really large groups have come back yet but uh, because it's a private house also um there never was a real big tour program at the house uh, the owner would you know show people around and a few bus trips would be scheduled every year but uh so actually it's coming back, but it's still pretty slow as far as uh, tours at the house. Thanks, Bill. Um, I, I'm, I think we're all dealing with different, um, uh, I don't know, say fallout from the pandemic or, or also different um, uh, results uh, now from the inscription itself. Um, there's so much we could probably dive into that, but we're just about out of time. So I'm going to switch to one other question. And this I would love for anyone to pop in and answer. Um, is there a unified plan to ensure all eight sites continue to meet World Heritage standards, or is it being left to each site to determine how to do it? And does anyone want to pop in first and start to answer that question? Well, I, I can field it. Um, Heidi, if you want. Um, so yes, please. Each, sure. So each site um, has a commitment to preservation um, and upholds the highest standards in, in preservation for our sites. So in addition to already having set standards before inscription, um, after inscription, and well into the future, we've all committed to maintaining uh, these sites uh, for future generations. Um, so all of us have a long-standing commitment to the, the preservation and perpetuity of our sites. And we uh, report annually um, on the state of preservation um, through what we call our Frank Lloyd Wright World Heritage Committee, uh, where we all kind of meet and hold ourselves accountable and report out on preservation issues and use that group as a forum for discussion uh, on all preservation issues. Thanks, Justin. You answered that perfectly. Did anyone else want to add anything before we wrap up? Okay, I do want to say it's been a wonderful collaborative effort between all eight sites. And of course, with the Frank Wood Wright Building Conservancy has been a leading the group effort. And um, it, we've have a lot of opportunities to promote each other, including these right virtual visits. And, and I think we all look forward to continuing to do that. Um, uh, once again, I just want to thank all of you for being here, for everyone for viewing. And uh, again, we apologize for any glitches with the video. Um, a, a, Fresh, clean video will be uploaded to our Facebook page um, when we're done with this live stream. It's also all of our videos are archived at the Building Conservancy's website, savewrite.org, as well as um, YouTube. So if you uh, want to view the video again, uh, minus the glitches, please do so. And please join us for next month's um, Right Virtual Visits, which will be on August 11th, featuring Taliesin West and Raycliff. And the theme will be Contemporary Art Installation. So that's going to be a really fun one. So so come right back to us again on August 11th. And uh, thank you everyone for uh, viewing and we hope you enjoyed the event today and um, have a wonderful afternoon.